In the summer of 1994, while living in the mountains of western Canada, Haramain, after months of following the developments of the Shoemaker-Levy comet, decided to pack his small personal telescope onto his rock sack and scale the closest, highest peak so that he may observe the comet colliding with the surface of Jupiter. Weeks prior to the event, the media, reporting from the astrophysical community, stated that none of the impacts would be visible to the amateur observer, and that these impacts may even be difficult for the high-powered telescopes to observe. Haramain, however, disagreed. To him, the impact of these high-velocity objects composed of H2O provided all the chemistry necessary for a fiery show, and Haramain was not about to miss it. Setting on the summit of Mount Wedge, Haramain night after night witnessed the awesome and spectacular event. In some cases, flames the size of Canada emerged from the impact coordinates, leaving behind enormous black depressions visible even with weak telescopic capacity. So one of those nights I was on the summit and it was just a magical moment. Um, on one side I had low cloud coverage over the peaks that were below me and I could see the lightning lighting up those clouds. And on the other side I had the sun setting and, and the moon was rising and it was just the most clear night. And I was looking at Jupiter through my telescope and I started to think of the surface feature of Jupiter and that huge red spot, almost one and a half times the size of the Earth on Jupiter that constantly, steadily stays at the same latitude. And I thought, what about that dynamic? Is that staying there for some particular reason? What is forcing that huge vortex of Coriolis dynamics to stay at that latitude all the time. Um, you'd expect that it would dissipate eventually, you'd expect that it would move in latitude, go all over the place, but it doesn't. And I thought, what if that structure on the surface of Jupiter is staying there because of the dynamics of the structure of the vacuum? The, tetrahedron inside the sphere dictating that energy event to happen at that particular spot on Jupiter. Upon his return, Haramain began to investigate. He found that not only did the red spot on Jupiter orbit very close to the magical 19.47 latitude, of the tetrahedron inscribed in a sphere, but that many other planets exhibited similar dynamics. Haramain was not the only one to have noted this phenomenon. At the time, Richard C. Hoagland, former science consultant to Walter Cronkite, CBS News, CNN, and NASA, had come to conclude that some hyperdimensional tetrahedral dynamics had to be at play in planetary structures. He noted that not only did the red spot on Jupiter exhibit the appropriate geometric latitude, but that many other planetary energy events were consistent with this geometry. The largest volcano in our solar system, Olympus Mons on Mars, is situated near 19.47 north latitude. Hoagland used this perspective as well to predict energy phenomena at specific latitudes on other planets that were later confirmed by NASA's probe photographs. So I applied the same geometry to the Earth and I realized that if you put a tetrahedron inside the Earth so that one point is at the south pole and the other points are at 19.47 latitude, on the surface of the Earth in the North Hemisphere. And I looked around to see what was there, and sure enough, I found the most active volcanoes on Earth, the Hawaiian volcanoes, exactly at that latitude. And then I went along that latitude, and I found the city of Titeunacan, uh, north of Mexico City, uh, to be at that latitude as well, which is quite remarkable. As we saw in the presentation, the mathematics of 
that city were decoded by Hugh Holliston Jr. to describe the dynamics of a sphere with a tetrahedron in it. And so not only does the city have these mathematics in it, but the city itself on the surface of the Earth is at that latitude that demarked the relationship of a tetrahedron and a sphere. Remarkable. However, Haramain's model predicted a 64 cube octahedron structure as the dynamics of the vacuum, and thus he wondered if they could be even clearer resolutions of the other intermediary angles produced by this more complex geometry. If so, it would give observational evidence that the structure of the vacuum is a result of the more complex array of an octahedron-tetrahedron matrix. Haramain looked at the bands of both Jupiter and Saturn and was amazed to find how closely these bands obey the angle relationship of the 64 tetrahedron grid. Furthermore, the recent data returned by the Cassini probe confirmed the presence of an enormous hexagonal feature on the north pole of Saturn, first imaged almost 27 years ago and still persistent to this day. The hexagonal structure, which is completely unexpected in standard models, not only obeyed the latitude dictated by the 64 tetrahedron grid, but is fundamental to the geometry of the cube octahedron at the center of Haramain's conceptual model and mathematics. Even more compelling is the recent imaging returned by the same probe of the south pole of Saturn, which in this case portrays an enormous vortex that seemed to be absorbing matter in a whirlpool. The south pole vortex leads to the center of the planet, as would the double torus dynamic resulting from the structure of the vacuum, as Haramain's model would predict. Our local star, the Sun, is no exception to this phenomenon. Hot bands of high-energy plasma and intense sunspot activity are found to stabilize at approximately 19.47 degrees latitude north and south. Our Sun follows a very regular 11-year cycle in which the Sun periodically flips its poles and increases its radiation intensity. The last solar maximum occurred in 2001, making the following maximum the year 2012. This date is in direct agreement with the so-called solar Mayan calendar and courtesies, still one of the most accurate calendars on Earth, which predicts that 2012 would mark a change in the sun's quality, resulting from a much larger cycle where our sun would transition from the fifth sun to the sixth sun. Haramain believes that these ancient traditions may have been tracking the larger cycles of the position of our solar system relative to the galactic disk. Our sun is located approximately 26,000 light years from the galactic center and orbits our galactic disk approximately once every 250 million years. However, our sun rotates along the galactic arm in a periodicity of approximately 60 million years, whereby the sun crosses the equator of our galactic disk once every 30 million years. So when we look at the dynamic of our galaxy, and, you know, based on the equations we wrote with uh, Einstein field equations with a torque term in it, the manifold of our galaxy is no longer, in terms of geometry of space-time, is no longer a sphere, but it's actually a double torus structure with vortices, which are visible. We know there's a huge vortex coming out the center of our galaxy. Uh, at the North Pole, we've been able to measure it, um, the North Pole of the galaxy, uh, if we want to call it that way. And uh, it's a large vortex, 3,000 light years long. And we know that the galaxy looks like a disk. And so those are the dynamics of the double torus, you know, with a torus on top and a torus on the bottom, like a sphere with two vortices and an equatorial disk. Well, our solar system is in an arm coming out of the huge black hole in the center of our galaxy. 
and that arm is rotating away from the center and our, galact our, our solar system is stuck in that galactic arm is rotating in that galactic arm and it passes back and forth across the galactic equator where the space-time manifold flattens and where you would get the maximum amount of radiation, galactic cosmic rays, which are particles that are accelerated throughout the galaxy and that are hitting matter as they go along and creating gamma rays and all sorts of dynamics. Now, when we passed that equator, I realized that that may be where the ancient Mayans and the solar calendar and all this was describing that there was going to be an energy increase, an energy event in our solar system resulting from our relationship to the galactic center, uh, which they talked about a lot. And, and that when we cross the galactic equator, we would uh, get bombarded with more galactic uh, cosmic rays that would activate the plasma dynamic of our sun and that the sun may go through a, a larger cycle in which in that moment it gets hotter and more active than it was in between when we're not going through the galactic equator. The Mayans said that that was going to occur around 2012 and I started to study uh, the solar cycle and I realized that the Sun flipped its poles every 11 years and that every 11 years it would get hotter more active and then cooler and less active in between the 11 year cycle I realized as well that the last cycle would occur approximately in 2000-2001. Adding 11 years to that matched the solar calendar of the Mayan in which um, you know the Sun would flip this pole and get active again in 2012. However, I deduced from the research, from my understanding of the mechanics of the physics and astrophysics of our sun, from my equations describing the plasma dynamics on the surface of the sun, my balance equation that describe a relationship between the gravitational side of our sun uh, dynamics and the electromagnetic side of our sun, that all these components put together would make this specific 11-year cycle between 2001 and 2012 most likely a much more active and a much more dynamic cycle than anything we've seen before since we've been recording since approximately Galileo. Recently, scientific papers have emerged using simulations based on previous data, which predict that our current solar cycle is going to be 30 to 50 percent more active than the previous cycle. As Harami notes, when the larger galactic cycle is considered, then our current solar cycle may develop into one of the most active cycles ever recorded. Applying the Haramain Rosher scaling law and his balance equation that relates the gravitational and electromagnetic components, Haramain further theorizes that our own sun's power levels may be driven by a small singularity at its center that he calls a white hole black hole, where hole is W H O L E. In this scenario, the information transfer dynamic across the white hole, black hole boundary event horizon drives the fusion structure of our sun. Haramain points out that these dynamics would produce dark, cooler regions that we call sunspots, which are actual vortices of material and electromagnetic radiation being sucked in towards the centering singularity, resulting in an elongation of the electromagnetic waveforms, generating high X-ray emissions in those regions, just as one would expect from material falling into the event horizon of a black hole. 
In this recent footage of the sun's outer limb return from the Japanese space telescope called Hinori, astronomers were startled at what they saw, where they expected to see large prominence of plasma ejections blowing into space. They were startled to find these ejections crashing down onto the sun's surface as if they were collapsing from exhaustion and being sucked into the sun and reabsorbed. Leading astrophysicist Dr. Leon Golub of the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics described these dynamics as impossible in the context of our current understanding of the sun's physics. However, Haramain's model predicts, as clearly seen in this footage, that a portion of the plasma ejections from the sun would be absorbed by the large voticular sunspot activity produced by the centering singularity of our sun. Furthermore, as the sunspot activity increases, so do the radiation levels. Therefore, an increase in sunspot activity would result in an increase in radiation in the whole of our solar system. Since the sun is 99.8% of the mass of our solar system, even a few degrees change in our sun's radio heat would have large consequences in the overall temperature of the Earth and its weather patterns. Haramain notes as well that the increase in solar flare strength that has been observed in the past few years, such as the record-breaking solar flare of November 2003, projects highly ionized plasma particles into our solar system, which eventually get caught in the magnetic lines of our Earth and are transported to the pole's geomagnetic vortices thereby heating up the atmosphere and the ice caps, resulting in the accelerated meltdown of the ice sheets. The increase in atmospheric temperature is further compounded by the greenhouse effect, where pollutants trap the heat as in an immense blanket inside the atmosphere. New data from the NASA experts resulting from satellite photography shows that the Greenland ice sheets are melting two times faster than previously expected. And new estimates predict that there may be a significant increase in sea levels over the next 10 to 100 years. And since many of the largest cities in the world are at sea level, such a change would have a dramatic effect on our society as a whole. The fresh water being dumped into our oceans will have large impacts on our climates and already the Gulf Stream current has been reported to have slowed down by 30 percent, the effects of which are only now beginning to be seen with increased hurricane activity, storms, and temperature extremes. These changes, interestingly, have been predicted by many ancient civilizations throughout the ages, talking about this moment in history as a moment in which we were going to encounter large changes on our planet and that it was going to be a precursor to a change in mentality, a change in society, a change in technology that would be forced out of this uh, large somewhat cataclysmically change, cataclysmic change on our planet. Some of that technology is emerging now and I'm very excited about, uh, about it. We may find ourselves living in a completely different society very shortly. Uh, I'm meaning in, within the next 15 years we might start to see technologies that allow us to beat the gravitational field and levitate things, uh, move off the surface of our planet, uh, and really give the Earth back to the Earth, allowing the Earth to become the garden again, and us living in a completely different relationship. Recent experiments by NASA have now shown that by rotating a superconductive ring, a significant reduction in weight is achieved. These are preliminary experiments that are rapidly moving towards our capacity to transcend the gravitational field and make gravitational drives commonplace. I call it getting the Z-axis. We've been living in a 
two-dimensional world and, uh, and we're learning now, I think we're going to arrive to the point where we're going to be able to move up and, and gain a whole new perspective on our relationship to our planet and our solar system and as a whole our universe. So that's exciting. So what have I learned from my life's research? Oh my God, that's a lot. But if I could summarize it, and it might sound really esoteric and far-fetched, but I assure you it's based on a lot of research. I believe that the history of our world may be quite different than what we've been told and taught. That in fact, the missing link between the Neanderthal and the Homo sapien is not just one link, but is a whole chain of events that have to do with advanced civilization coming to the earth, finding the earth in a state of very low level of evolution, and mixing their genes with ours to help the evolution along producing the Homo sapien with the largest, with the larger brain and so on. This change or this advancement in our evolutionary step is described and in many, many different societies around the world in ancient texts, in legends, in myths of creation all defining these advanced civilization coming to the earth called the sun gods or uh, the sons of God having children with the women of the earth or mixing their genes with the people of the earth to produce this new human and I believe that that interaction with this advanced civilization has been there all along our, our history. That at first they may have given us even advanced technology, one of the most powerful piece of technology they had. Um, a technology that could fly a ship or produce large amount of energy or uh, produce fields that helps things grow, that can structure water, that can do all sorts of things that we would think of even today as miraculous. That very advanced technology I believe was present at the earliest time of our history and then was removed eventually because of a need to allow our growth to mature before we would have that level of power again. I believe at that time a decision was made, however, to embed all the information we needed to recover that level of technology so that we could have it on time for the changes that are about to occur on our planet at this time. That information was embedded in religious belief and cultural structures, even in building practices so that it would be encoded and passed on from generation to generation to this time for you and me to recover and decode and apply it properly for advanced technology and philosophy. The advanced technology that comes out of this knowledge could have fundamental 
repercussion on our society, which cha would change our society dramatically from a society that lives really on a flat plane to a society that has access to what I call the Z-axis, have access to our solar system and maybe even access to our galaxy. I believe as well that there is a fundamental warning in all these texts, in all this knowledge that says to us, when you get that level of technology, it is crucial that you have grown to becoming a benign, collaborative society instead of a competitive, warring one. And I think and I see around me and I see in the development of this planet and of this earth and the, our society at this time that we are learning those lessons very rapidly. The field is very polarized. Many people are choosing peace, spiritual involvement, and collaboration. And many are choosing war and competition. And it's becoming obvious which one is most powerful, which one is the one that is going to be necessary for our evolutionary step at this time in history. I think we're going to be pushed along to learn those lessons because of changes as well on our planet that is going to create a certain amount of stress on our society to force us to collaborate. I am so excited to be here at this time in history when we're about to cross the event horizon of our evolutionary development. To do it with you, to do it with all of us, in collaboration, in peace. I feel that we are entering into an era of galactic relationship, when we can rise to our full potential and become the galactic beings that we are.